veterans a free meal on Veterans Day. And, or you can get free coffee and donuts at other places if you know where to look. And, and it's wonderful to do that, but you know, our primary purpose, understand in this life, is not to serve a country, but to serve our Lord. And that's what we're about, serving Jesus. And what we do as we study God's Word today is to look at Jesus and fall in love with Him all over again. You know, today we look at a, a hard section because it, it deals with the rejection of Jesus by the entire nation that He came to save. We see this in, in John chapter 11, verses 45 through 57. Let's read this passage together in respect for God's Word. May we stand together. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away our place and nation. Then Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die and not the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. Therefore, Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim, and there remained with his disciples. And the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover, to purify themselves. Then they sought Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think that he will come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it that they might seize him. The Lord had his blessing for the reading of his word. Do you remember the context, the scene that's going on right at the moment? You know, here is Lazarus. Lazarus has been dead four days. Mary and Martha had sent for Jesus. Jesus came, and, and the, 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 emphasis, the uh, emphasis that they were giving was, Jesus, if you'd just been here, he wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. You know, he will see life again, but nobody understood it. So he went to the tomb, and he, he said, take away the stone. And Martha objected, you know, don't. By this time, he stinks. And Jesus commands, Lazarus, come forth. And he comes forth. Put yourself in that situation. You're sitting there, and here comes Lazarus, the guy that's been dead for four days. And you go, whoa. Well, I mean, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? I mean, you go, oh, and you'd be gasping for breath. Hmm? And, and, and Mary and Martha, what, what's going on with me? They would run, and they'd hug Lazarus, and, and they'd be weeping and laughing, and, and, and people would be going, whoa. And then they'd probably had a big party, you know, and a, a, a celebration, and they'd be dancing and hooting and hollering. 
John doesn't say a word about that. Not one word. You know what he focuses on? Look. The rejection of the nation. That's the very next thing that he talks about. John focuses on the Jewish leadership. Why did they want to kill Jesus? I mean, he was a great teacher. People were following him. He healed the sick, the blind, the lame. He raised the dead. I mean, this was a good guy. One reason. I'll use two words to describe the reason because they're the flip side of the same coin. Jealousy and envy. Oh, Pilate recognized that when he crucified Jesus. They did it out of envy. <laughs> One man said, Nothing arouses envy so much in the heart as the triumph clang of another man's fame. And look what was happening. People were flocking to Jesus. Wouldn't you? In that same situation? And they were envious, jealous. Today, we focus on this national rejection. We focus on these leaders. And even on a subject which they themselves didn't even realize. The substitute substitutionary atonement that comes through faith in Jesus. When Caiaphas makes the statements, shouldn't one man die for a nation? That's what we're going to look at today, this idea. Now first, let's look at the reaction that occurs in verses 45 and 46 when, when, when Jesus has raised Lazarus. Some people believed. Uh, wow. That's, that's great. I mean, they should, shouldn't they have? Uh, here they've seen one of the greatest miracles, if not the greatest miracle of all times. Shouldn't they believe? Now, understand this. I think faith based on miracles is not the strongest of faith. But John takes what's he got, and he says, some believed. They saw a dead man come out of a tomb at the direction of Jesus, and they said, this has definitely got to be the Messiah. There's something specific about this going on. But here's the amazing thing. Some rejected. Here they've seen this great thing, and what did they do? They turn into snitches. Tattletales. They turn tail and run to the high priest and to the council and say, look at what this Jesus is doing. Why? Why didn't they believe? It's so absurd not to. I I'm reminded of the other Lazarus in Luke 16. You remember the episode of Lazarus and the rich man? And Lazarus dies and the rich man dies, and the rich man's in torments, and, and Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom. And the rich man begs Abraham to send someone back to, to warn his brothers. And what did he say? They have Moses and the prophets. If they will not believe Moses and the prophets, they will not believe the one raised from the dead. What had just happened, guys? Somebody had been raised from the dead. Did they believe? No. You know what that shows me? Unbelief is not about information and facts. It's a choice of the heart to rebel and reject God. Have you ever shared the gospel with someone? I have. Have they, how many have been rejected when you shared the gospel? They didn't receive, they wouldn't. I, I have lots of time. 
Why? You spoke the truth, didn't you? Nod your heads this way. Yeah. I hope you did. <laughs> you gave them the facts, and they still rejected. You see, faith is not based on facts. We have the facts. There is a God, his name is Jesus, and he rose from the dead. That's a fact. There's no more documented event in history than that. But do people believe? No. Why? Because they've rejected God in their heart. It's always a case of where your heart is. Do you want to believe in Jesus? And, and here we had all these people who have rejected Jesus already. And even though the evidence is clearly laid in front, they do what? Totally and completely reject it. So what did they do? The Sanhedrin meets. The, the Sanhedrin, uh, by nature, I probably should define who they are. Uh, they're the ruling body of the religious Isra Israelite people, the Jews. Uh, the Sanhedrin started, and there is debate and conjecture on this, probably with Moses. Remember when Moses called the elders, and there, he called out 70 elders? Do you know how many people were on the Sanhedrin? 71. The 70 elders and Moses make 71. And they were responsible for the ruling of the people. The Sanhedrin consisted of the high priest and priest and members of the elders and, you know, the highly recognized. At that time, there were two major bodies of religious belief. Uh, there were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Which do you think you might clo most closely relate to? You're all a bunch of Pharisees. Oh, what? The Pharisees were the conservatives. They believed the Bible, all of it, that they had at that time, the 39 books of the Old Testament. They, they believe you took it literally that there was a heaven and a hell and judgment. They believed in angels, all those things. So you would be a what? A Pharisee. Oh, you don't like that. You are not looking at me with favor when I say that. The Pharisees were nice guys, by and large. But then there were the Sadducees. The Sadducees, you know what we'd call them today? Liberals. They didn't believe that the Bible was totally accurate, that they ignored it. They didn't believe in a heaven and a hell and a final judgment. They didn't believe in angels or afterlife or any of that stuff. That's what they were. And by the way, the Pharisees and Sadducees, when they sat on this, they fought with each other. Remember what Paul did back in Acts? where you started to fight, saying, I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees and all that, and then they started arguing with each other. And he started a nice riot in the middle of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the rulers of the people. At different times, they had different jurisdiction in terms of civil matters. For instance, during the time of Jesus, they were under the control of Pontius Pilate. He did not allow the Sanhedrin to execute capital punishment. While later in the book of Acts, the Sanhedrin executed people. Why? It depended upon the governor. Sometimes he let them, sometimes he didn't. But under Pilate, he didn't allow them to. So they had no ability to carry out capital punishment. But they began to ask themselves this question. They ask, what are we accomplishing? What have they set out to do? Well, they questioned John the Baptist. They questioned Jesus. They questioned every time there was a miracle, they sent somebody, they examined him, they purposed him, they tried to arrest him. They, how successful were they? They weren't. Why? 
Because God's still in control, not the Sanhedrin. They had tried, and so to summarize what they tried, they questioned him, they examined him, they accused him, they challenged him, they tried to arrest him, and what have they accomplished? Zip. And so they were in a fury. Now, here's an, an, an interesting thing in their debate. They have a marvelous admission. Here is this man performing many miraculous signs. Catch that. They admit he's doing what? He's doing miraculous signs. What had they come to him before and asked him and told him? Show us a sign. Show us a sign. They admitted in private he was doing signs. But they wouldn't in public. Because if they admitted in public, what would happen? The people would turn and say, well, then why don't you believe? But they didn't believe. It's interesting to me that the Sanhedrin felt they had to take some decisive action, but they didn't know what to do until their motive is revealed. The motive is stated right here. You look in verse 48. It says, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe. And the Romans will come and take away our place, our nation. What were they concerned about? What everybody in politics is concerned about now. Power, position, prestige. They didn't give a hoot about their relationship to God. All they cared about is what people thought of them and the money they had and the place they had. That's all they cared about. And so they were arguing for that. They were afraid they'd lose their place in society. Wow. Wow. And you know the thing they feared? They feared that Rome would come and take away everything they had. Rome did. Forty years later. The very thing they feared came upon them because they refused to do what God had told them to do. Wait a second. I think I've heard this story before. Israel coming out of Egypt. What did they fear? Our bodies will lay, be laid asunder in the desert. What happened to them? Their bodies were laid asunder. Why? Because they didn't do what God had told them to do. Caution. The same can happen to us. If we refuse to do what God is telling us to do because we're afraid, I almost guarantee you the giants that you fear will come upon you. God will give them to you because that's what you were afraid of. There's only one thing to do. Do what God has called you to do and plow forward with vim and vigor. It may be hard, that's the only way to avoid the giants. Do what God has called us to do. Or otherwise your fears will come up on you. So they make a decision. The solution. Now let me put this in the words of the Trekkies in here. Any Trekkies? In the first generation of Trekkies, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Now, in the second generation, that's Captain Kirk's words, not Spock's in the first generation. I'm up on both. <laughs> yeah, I followed him. What does that mean? Better for one to die than everyone else. Here's a high priest. He comes out. High priest is Caiaphas. Oh, whose little box did we see last week? Joseph Caiaphas, same guy. 
entirely possible. That little box with his bones in it. Caiaphas, he is the high priest. Now, his father-in-law was high priest before him. But Caiaphas had the title and therefore the position. Uh, father-in-law got a little bit too old, therefore he gets kicked out of the position. So he comes in his sweet, sweet refrain and says, this is no joke, I'm not exact exaggerating. You morons, you imbeciles, you nincompoops, you ignoramuses. That's what he's calling the Sanhedrin. By the way, the Sadducees were noted for their caustic relationship. Josephus, the great Jewish historian of this century, he says the Sadducees were mean. Now, I'm translating that. They were mean to themselves and to everyone else. He says to their friends they were mean. So they weren't a bunch of nice people. And when you're the high priest and you've got all authority given to you, guess what? You can be as mean and nasty to everybody as you want. And he comes up with the solution. Drastic. Let's kill him. I shake my head at this because this is the spiritual leader. Let's kill him. Let's get him out of the way. And he makes this statement. Better for one to die than a nation. Wow. Wow. You know what John does at this point? You read the narrative and he translates it. He says, wait a second. This is true. This is true. What Caiaphas did is made an unintended prophecy. Now this baffles my mind. Because Caiaphas institutes the idea of substitutionary atonement. One person would die for a nation. Now, his motives was wrong. He was sinful in his spirituality. And yet, he made a statement that was absolutely true. By the way, you know what that teaches me? God, in his sovereignty, can use non-Christians, heretics, the unspiritual, ungodly spiritual leaders to speak the truth. Just because they're a heretic doesn't mean what they're saying is wrong all the time. Be careful of total and absolute rejection of someone just because they're maybe not totally in your camp. God can even use them. You know, it, it, it's interesting. God, when I look in the Bible, used people of that nature multiple times. You remember Balaam and the donkey? This guy was a corrupt prophet. And yet God used him. God even spoke to him directly. I go, I don't understand that. But God's God. He can do whatever he wants. And he spoke through Caiaphas. This, this thing that the scripture had talked about. And what he said is absolutely true. It's better for one person to die than everybody. That's what Jesus said did he died for a nation and not just this nation the nation of Israel but for John makes it clear for all people for everyone isn't it better that one die than us die can't you see God in this situation trying to say I love you. I care for you. And there's no way you can take care of yourself, so guess what I'll do? I'll pay the penalty for your sin. I'll die for you. And Caiaphas, this antagonist to Jesus, 
was used of God. Oh, by the way, that does give me hope. If he could use a, an evil person, maybe he could use me who wasn't quite as evil. Okay, that's my hope. So they draw up a plot, a plot to kill Jesus. And what does he do? He withdraws. His time wasn't there yet. He goes to the town of Ephraim. We're not exactly sure which one there is because there were multiple ones of them. But we know it's someplace in the desert. There's a place that's about 12 miles from Jerusalem to the south and east that has been identified as a possible place. But that's kind of close. That's kind of close to Jerusalem. It's only 12 miles away. So we don't know exactly where it was, but Jesus went with his disciples to get out of range. To get out of range. At that point, John mentions the Passover. Uh, this is the third Passover mentioned in John. I think there were four Passovers during his life and ministry. John doesn't cover one of them. And then they send out the question. Where is he? Find him. And then people coming into Jerusalem for the Passover began to ask, is he coming? Is he going to come? That's next week and the week after. So we won't go there. So let me summarize. A warrant has been issued in Jesus' name by the Sanhedrin. They've got all their spies looking for him. And when he comes, they are going to kill him. Well, what can we learn from this? You know, how's my life going to be different? How do I become a better disciple? How do I, I fall in love with Jesus all over again? Here are a couple of things that I thought about in my own life. First, trust in God's sovereignty. God can use evil men, evil circumstances for his purpose. Caiaphas instituted the plan by which God would sacrifice his son to pay for our sins. Can't he control circumstances? And the answer is yes. Nothing happens in this life that he's not the sovereign God over. I was reading a story that occurred at a Louis Palau evangelistic conference in London. Some of you may have heard of Luis Plow. He is the South American uh, Spanish uh, Billy Graham. And he was having a crusade in, in London and it rained. And it rained. It was pouring rain. And at the altar call, you know, like Billy Graham, he has people that come forward that are counselors and whatnot. And, and when they come forward, people start to come because they see other people. This one lady was stationed at a point. She stood, and here comes a man. And she can't see because it's raining so hard that her brim of her cap, you know, is, is like this. And, and she says to the man, do you want to go forward to receive Jesus? And he said, yes. So they start walking together. It was her brother that she hadn't seen in seven years. Is God in control? And God gave her that privilege. God is in control of the bad things as well as the good things. And our tendency is when the bad things occur, we cry out and we scream to God. Can we trust him? Can we trust him? And the answer is yes, we can. He's going to work all things together for good. So regardless of the circumstances and situations you're in, understand God's still on the throne. Second thing, watch your life, guard your life about jealousy and envy. 
It'll lead to your destruction. Here are three things that we can do to overcome envy and jealousy. And believe me, we all struggle with jealousy and envy. Y'all know the difference? Jealousy is wanting what somebody else has. Envy is wanting the same thing that the other person has. Flip sides of the same coin. First thing, recognize this, that jealousy and envy is sin. It's wrong. You know, you look at Proverbs 27, 4. Anger is cruel and fury overwhelming, but he who, who can stand against jealousy? We all struggle with it at different times, different stages of life. Admit it to God that it's sin. Second, we need to change our mindset. You know, apply Romans 12, 1 and 2. Be transformed. Transform our thinking about it. Don't conform. Uh, understand what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. And so what we have to do is love instead of desire. The third thing is we need to pray for those who fill us with jealousy and envy. Ask for their blessing. Wow. That's a change of mind, isn't it? Pray for them. There once was a preacher who was surrounded by great preachers and their churches were full and overflowing and they built bigger churches and they asked him are you jealous he says no I pray that they get more and more people because I get the overflow <laughs> pray for them the third thing understand God's plan for substitution God has substituted himself for us. And we have to receive the substitution. His willingness to die for us. I read the story of a couple in, in Kansas a while back. A poor family. They just had a little baby, six month old. And in that area, they're prone to a thing called tornadoes. They were in the house and the tornado siren blue and before they could do anything it was on them the next day they were searching through the rumble and wreckage of the neighborhood where this tornado hit and they found the baby underneath the bodies of the parents who had laid themselves so that their child would not die that's what God did for us he laid himself over us so that we would not have to experience the pain and death that's caused by sin. Accept the substitution of Jesus for you. Believe in him. Don't reject him. It's not a matter of how much you know. It's belief in him as the son of God.